Okay. Mm -mm. We'll call this special workshop meeting the Jacksonville City Council to order and uh, Council, you have before you a copy of the agenda for tonight's, the proposed agenda for tonight's meeting and at this time I'd entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. A motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? All right, first item on the agenda for tonight is the parks update. Richard, I'll turn it over to you at this time. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, tonight we do have two items on the workshop we would like to deal with. One is the parks update and the other is, has, is the hazard mitigation plan. To present the parks update, we have the interim directors, co-directors. You'll notice that one is uh, beautiful and intelligent and the other is a man. <laughs> so uh, I'm this time going to introduce to you, of course, Michael LaCory and Susan Baptist, who in my opinion are doing an excellent job as the co-directors of this department. They're gonna provide you some information relative to Phillips Park, and then they're going to be asking you for some direction on Phillips Park specifically relative to the dilemma we face on the grant and, and a matter that's impacting that grant. After that, we're going to be giving you an update on the progress that we're making on improvements throughout the park system. So at this time, Michael, if you would. Sure. Thank you, uh, Dr. Woodruff, uh, Mayor and Council. Thank you for uh, allowing us this opportunity. Both Susan and I appreciate it. Our uh, presentation tonight is in two phases. The first is Phillips Park. Our plan with Phillips Park, uh, in accordance with our master plan, was to move out two of the existing elements you see, the ball fields, the Lions Field, and Joe Morgan Field. And while we were moving them out of the park, we weren't moving them out of our inventory. We were going to replace them in other parks, and we'll get to that uh, as we move forward, as well as our outdoor basketball court. What we wanted to do was move in a boardwalk around the waterfront, uh, a canoe and kayak facility, an open-air amphitheater, as well as picnic shelters. In 2013, uh, we applied for and were approved for a part of grant. Uh, the key elements in, in that grant was the outdoor amphitheater, the kayak launch, the shelter with the restrooms, and a playground with some rubberized surfacing. The cost for the total grant was nine, or the total project cost was $990,000. The city's part of that was $500,000, and the grant was bringing us $490,000. While this grant was awarded in 2013, our responsibility was to have it completed by 2016. This is just a site plan basically of what we submitted to Part F when we did the grant. Um, as you can see, or hopefully you can see, there's an entrance off US 17, which is kind of like the entrance we have today off US 17. However, what is missing is the entrance off Phillips Road. Currently at Phillips Park in its present state, you can enter the park from Phillips Road, you can enter the park from 17, but there's no connectivity. One of the things that we wanted to do was provide connectivity to this park as we moved forward. Uh, in addition, we were gonna put these key elements in here, the amphitheater, the um, playground, the restrooms, concession stand, these sorts of items. And uh, just to give you an idea of what it would have looked like. Stepping back a little bit, right before we received the grant, as you'll recall, <coughs> the existing seawall over at Phillips Park, a section of it failed. Um, through some great work through our streets department and, and some help with stormwater, they, they were able to level this out in-house, do the work themselves, uh, put some uh, wetland plantings in, and while it did cost $100,000, I, I gotta tell you it's probably the cheapest route we could have took, and I don't know that we would have got a better product than what we have out there today. So phase one of our part of grant moving forward now was to do our project design, add the shelter, the playground, do the enhanced parking with the connecti connectivity, uh, make some stormwater improvements to the site, make sure the restrooms are more centrally located than they are today, and add the canoe and kayak launch, and then add the amphitheater. Again, city's cost for this is 500,000 with the grant matching up to the, the 490,000 for the total 990. Stepping back, just to give us some history about Phillips Park, somewhere around the 50, right up until the mid 50s, this was a, it's a landfill. 
a dump, if you will. Um, it ceased operation in the mid to late 50s, early 60s, and in the mid 60s, a park was developed. In 1977, uh, the Land, Water, and Conservation Fund, we received a grant to develop some items within the park. At that time, an environmental assessment occurred. We went through it, uh, and, and we, we did good with it. So we were able to build these elements with us meeting any environmental standards at that time. What we've learned moving forward as we've worked on with our design people is that the landfill needs to have another environmental assessment done. Why does it need to have an assessment done? Because it's not officially closed yet. And just so you know, there's over 600, somewhere around 650 landfills in our state that are not closed currently. Uh, we're on a list to be closed. So uh, this was one of the things we found out as we went through this process. And, and you know, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, actually, we've been made aware of it before we did any work. Just to give you, a, again, an idea of Phillips Park, it's, it's almost nine acres. And you can see in the blue and in the orange, this is where the dump was located. Um, if you don't understand, that is basically the park itself. There's a little outline areas out there, but basically that is the park. Uh, so that creates a little bit of havoc for us moving forward, knowing that this is the area that does have to be assessed. So what does that mean to us at this point? Well, an assessment is going to cost anywhere between $150,000 to $250,000. The good news is Diener is going to pay for that. The unfortunate news is we're not scheduled for give or take three to five years from now to be finished with that assessment. That, that takes us to 2018 to 2020. What does that mean to us? Well, the dilemma that we're running into is that our improvements for the grant need to be completed by 2016. The assessment won't be completed in 2018 under the best case scenario as late as 2020. Unfortunately, we can't start improvements until our assessment is complete. If we were to start doing some of these improvements, we would, we would take on all risk for that. Uh, I don't think that's, a, you know, that may be an area I don't know that we're willing to go in. Um, I think it's also important to point out that with the environmental assessment that was done in the 70s, you know, as Phillips Park sits today with the elements that are out there, the ball fields and the playground and, and the basketball courts, it's a safe park today. It's the minute we start try to, trying to dig out there and, and turn up some of what this is under the dump that the environmental standards change for us. So I don't want it to, to leave anyone with the thought that this is not a safe park. It's a safe park in its current condition. As we move forward trying to develop it, to develop it excuse me, is where we're going to run into some problems with having to have an assessment done. So what does that mean to us? What are our options right now? Um, we could ask for an extension from PARTA. Unfortunately, we can't ask for that extension until we're six months away from our original end date, which is uh, June of 2016. So that's tough, and we can only ask for a one-year extension. Even if we waited to that point and they gave us that extension, uh, again, bear in mind, 2018 to 2020 is the earliest that the assessment is going to be done. We're still not meeting our needs at that point. Another option we've looked at as a staff is, and talked with part of about is, we could take the existing grant possibly and the elements in it and move it to another park. And we'll get to that in a minute. And two of the parks we identified were Northeast Creek and Kerr Street. The other option, our third option, is we could de decline the grant. That's unfortunate if that comes to that, but it may be something we have to do. Either way, these are all the options that are in front of us. So let's talk about Northeast Creek. This right here is a site plan we had done a couple years ago for Northeast Creek. And just to explain the drawings for you and, and kind of acquaint you with where we're at at Northeast Creek, the three blue triangles you see are, the, are what we know today as the adult fields. We were looking at making those fields into youth fields and adding one there. You can also see the burgundy area. That's the additional parking that we would need to add out there. That big green area there is the 14 
acres that was once the lagoons. So adding four ball fields there and doing some other work out there such as adding the concession stand, bathroom facilities and new playgrounds. So kind of fits in there with the elements. Our comprehensive master plan identified Northeast Creek as a park that was, was possibly in need of a recreation center, basketball courts, tennis courts, additional picnic shelters, and additional soccer, football, multi-purpose fields. Again, the elements for the grant, water access. We have that at Northeast Creek. Acreage needed for an amphitheater. We have that at the Lagoons. Playground, yes, the playground at Northeast Creek, we've heard, uh, hopefully you remember you've heard from us, we need to change the playground out there. It's a little outdated. And the restroom facilities definitely are outdated out there. They were built in the mid 80s. Um, it's an option. We're not sure as a staff that this is the right park for these elements. I will tell you all of these elements. We're not sure that the amphitheater fits at Northeast Creek. Um, Kerr Street was another option we looked at. The comprehensive master plan at Kerr Street says establish this as a regional park. Well, what does that mean? That means take River Walk, LP Willingham, Kerr Street, Sturgeon City, make it one large park. Uh, replace the existing recreation center with a new one. Uh, remove the ball field, Johnny Crawford Field. Add shelters. Connect Sturgeon City Boardwalk down to the waterfront at Kerr Street. Well, we kind of meet some of the elements there. We felt like in in that area, Kerr Street specifically, their current condition, we have the water access, we can do work with the playground. We don't feel like there's an amphitheater spot down there right now. So we didn't think this was probably our best option, but we thought it was important for you to know that we looked at these as possible options to basically lift the granite and move it to these parks. So where does that leave us? Recommendations. I think from our seat, what we would like to see, or, or what we think is the, is the move to make right now, is request the owner to, to move forward with the, with the assessment. They'll pay for it, let's have that done, and that would be a good move for us as a city, possibly. Declining the grant from part of, while unfortunate to do that, um, I think it, at this point in time, it's probably the right thing to do. I think it's important also to, to let you know that in the last uh, day, I've talked with John Poole, who is the uh, director of grant funding for PARDUF as well as LWCF. And in my lifetime in recreation parks, one of the things you never wanted to do was turn a grant in. You know, we always heard if you turn a grant in, you'll never get another one. Uh, John was nice enough to, to reach out to, to, to me specifically about this situation we're having at Phillips Park and he assured me that for environmental purposes if we were to turn this grant in they're not going to hold that against us matter of fact they're almost going to applaud us for turning it in for the environment environmental purposes so he's assured me that this will not work against you moving forward as you want to apply for grants either from part of from the Park and Recreation Trust Fund or from the Land Water Conservation Fund I think that's important for us to know moving forward uh, once the assessment's done, refile the grant after the assessment's completed, and then we can move forward with Phillips Park. Uh, and the fourth recommendation is for us to continue moving forward at Jack Amia and Kerr Street in the fiscal years 15, 16, and 17. For me right now, before we go further into uh, the next part of our, our phase of our, our presentation, I think it's, if you would, we, I, we would ask that you would give us a little direction on how you think we should move forward. Let me make a, a comment regarding relocating the grant. Uh, we met with uh, Steve Mueller, is that Mueller. Mueller, Mueller, who is the representative for Part F of this area. And Steve asked us to look at relocating the grant. The, we did that, and while you know, Michael has, has shown you the two parks we identified, the reality is the analysis on how we would use those parks in the future, I think, is still very much a valid analysis. Uh, we don't believe that Northeast Creek is the right place for the amphitheater. And when we talked to PARDAF, what they said was the amphitheater is really the reason why you got the grant. It, it wasn't the bathrooms. It wasn't the picnic shelters. You find those in any park that unless you can really find a site for the amphitheater, then your, your odds of getting this grant approved in a new location is really not very good. 
if you think of the amphitheater, uh, certainly uh, it makes noise because it's an amphitheater. I mean, even Clemson fans who play FSU this coming weekend don't understand what noise is about. The bottom line, though, is that park has very, very limited access on getting into the park. That one road going in and the fact that it serves the boat ramp and it serves the ball fields, we just feel like that putting an amphitheater there is putting too many important traffic generating functions in one area. You really need, I think, the amphitheater, which we had designed to hold between 300 and 500 people. We had hoped that it would be in a facility or at least a part of town where you had multiple ways to get in and out. Now, even at Phillips Park, it's going to be a challenge, but at least there we had two ways to get in and out from the parking that was serving the amphitheater. Bottom line is you do have two options. Kerr Street, very difficult to put an amphitheater down there because of what's there as far as space. And of course the second is Northeast Creek. Uh, as the senior management, I will tell you, we support these recommendations. And one of the reasons why we support them is because we know that if we move forward with spending, if we move forward with the improvements on Phillips Park without the assessment, that Part F will not pay one penny of those. So the only way you're going to get a grant or, or spend Part F money on any park is to have their blessings as to the site, and we know they won't bless Phillips Park. So. What does that actually mean? So far, we have spent about, what, 35? 35,000 on design. Okay. And what that means is that Part F won't even pay for half of that. So the design work, as soon as we saw this about a month ago, you'll recall we sent you some emails. Uh, we stopped everything with the consultant. We think the consultant's concepts for Phillips Park are still valid. So what we're proposing is we simply you know, I don't know whether we'll actually cancel the contract. That's probably the best thing to do with the consultant because you're looking at delaying this project three to five years, so it's probably best just simply to cancel it. At least the work that we've gotten for the $35,000 gives us some good ideas on how we might want Phillips Park to be used. The other thing we know is this. Everything in life changes based upon time. And three years from now, we may decide that the plan that we were thinking was the right plan for Phillips Park is still the right plan, or we may decide it's the wrong plan for some reason that we haven't incurred or yet understood. So these are our recommendations, and we really need direction from council. Uh, if you concur with turning the grant back in, then on your October 21st meeting, there will be a formal resolution which council is saying, thank you, but due to these conditions, we're having to turn it in. Now with that, let's open it up for questions and discussion. Yes, sir. When you talked about um, Kerr Street being a, a regional park and um, that including Sturgeon City, could the part of it be used at like Kerr Street and part of it Sturgeon City, is it? site specific to one place or can you respond yeah with the current grant that we have it is site specific so while we could move it from maybe phillips park and, and we can check further on this uh, generally part of is very site specific so you would move it into one park not into dual parks where you couldn't spend as an example two hundred and fifty thousand to do some improvements at Kerr Street and take the additional 250 and, and move it to Sturgeon City. And we did ask him that, and one of the things he reminded us was that in the city's history, and I think it was a land water conservation grant, that in the city's history they had approved, I think they said five different parks in one grant, and they said they have gone away from that model because managing that in different sites, that they just don't do that anymore. It has to be in one site. Not the, I'm sorry. The problems that, uh, with the environmental aspect that you encountered at uh, Phillips Park, would you have the same problems at Sturgeon City because it used to be a landfill also? The answer there is yes. You will recall that the center, that the, um, that the Sturgeon City Education Facility is currently being delayed by almost a year because we ran into the same thing. 
everyone on the staff, and I believe the council, had assumed that the Sturgeon City landfill had been closed. Uh, unfortunately, we have found that it still has not been closed. Mm -hmm. So they are now, they meaning Diener, they had their uh, personnel on site, I believe within the month of uh, August, it may have been July, to do their final assessments. So hopefully within the next three or four months, we're gonna get approval to move forward with that building. But once again, uh, these old landfills that we assumed were closed, and let's make sure we understand what the term closed means. They are only closed for the period that you are actually using a specific plan. So when we talked about putting the uh, education center down at Sturgeon City, that reopened the closure. And every time that we go into any of these landfills and propose a new use, they're going to require a new assessment. So let's take Phillips Park, for example. Let's say that three years from now we get the assessment and the assessment says everything is great. Go ahead and build this plan. 20 years down the road, a new council will then say, well, we now want to do something different at Phillips Park. They're going to have to go through an assessment again. The assessment will analyze what is the impact of your proposed improvements at that site versus the type of material that was deposited there. One thing that we know always is what? Environmental regulations always get tighter and tighter and tighter. And things that we thought we could live with 20 years ago, and my wife says part of my problem is I ran my bicycle behind a uh, mosquito truck for too many years. Well, as kids, we thought that was okay. Today, they say you really shouldn't do that unless you want to grow up being a Clemson football player. Okay? <laughs> anyway, so the answer, the short answer to the, to the long answer is this. We would have to do an assessment again at Sturgeon City for these uses because we're currently doing one for the proposed building. Okay, the reason I asked about Sturgeon City is because the bowl that we have there is ideal for an amphitheater. If you go there and you don't know too much about it, you would think that that's what is being designed there. Are you saying that that use, if we um, finished it, if you will, would be something that would require a different assessment because I thought that it was already approved for that kind of use? Actually, I will verify with Glenn Hargett, but I believe that the bowl in the master plan that was approved by, uh, by the agencies, the state agencies, actually called that bowl to be a butterfly garden. It was not set up to be an amphitheater, but we can verify that for you. And we can verify that between now and, and whatever action you What do you mean? Was it approved for that use because of the landfill situation? as a butterfly garden, as you refer to? It was, it was approved for that use as part of the redevelopment of the landfill. Now, we will verify that and, and see. Now, Mr. So Lord you're saying if it was changed to a different use, that correct. was changed to a different use, it would trigger another yes. environmental assessment. And the other part that we would mention, uh, we have found over the last, certainly not the last week or two with all the rain, but over the last several years, we have found that, that where that slopes down, that's an extremely wet site. So while the bowl concept would look great, and I agree with you, that would be a fabulous place for an amphitheater, it, it would have some challenges. But we would need to, to look at the assessment and we would need to look at the location. So well, I'm totally confused yeah. about <coughs> somewhere in the early part of the discussion, we said that the Phillips Park landfill had never been officially closed. And then you, you mentioned that any time you activate a new use for it, you have to go through a reassessment. I was not aware in the years I've been here that Phillips Park ever had been officially closed as a landfill. We just assumed it, that it was done and an assessment wasn't necessary. So I don't know where we stand on this now. We're we talking about two different kinds of assessments because it seemed like we got the assessment for, for Sturgeon City rather quickly compared to how long it's going to take us to get an assessment for Phillips Park. Are there two different types of assessments 
<coughs> the answer there is they are the same. The, differ the difference, though, is that Sturgeon City, we have ongoing monitoring wells that have been installed, and as they came up and did their testing, one of the well sites, which is down at the very end of where the parking lot's going to be for the new building, in the water quality monitoring, they identified lead. Now, what that probably is, is an interstate battery that was put in there in 1970, you know, by somebody. But the bottom line is, they really are similar assessments, but they are in very different degrees. The Sturgeon City program is an ongoing monitoring program, whereas the Phillips Park doesn't have any ongoing monitoring. It was assessed before the 1976 grant. They gave us approval under that assessment. And what they're saying is that if you want to change Phillips Park, they're not opposed to it, but you're going to have to go through a new environmental assessment that once again analyzes what's underground versus how you're proposing to use it. So really there is no official closure of any landfill? Well, let's put it this way. I know that Phillips Park has never been officially closed. I mean, that's what they're telling us. And, and to be honest with you, that came as a surprise to us because as we did the research, we have always understood that Phillips Park was closed, that there were no environmental issues. And I want to stress again, there are no environmental issues relative to how we're currently using the park. But what the Diener folks told us in Raleigh was this. If you open it, you own it. Now, what does that mean? If we go in there and we start digging footers or whatever, whatever we encounter, the city becomes liable to take out. If Diener does their assessment, whatever they encounter that's negative, they will pay. And because of that, it will open us up to a liability that we just simply can't recommend to you. I think Mr. Thomas had a comment. I mean, yeah, like I said, it's confusing, but you're talking about the assessment as it's almost a foregone conclusion that it'll be come out positive. Is that a misconception there? I mean, that, well, that they, you say if they open it up, they'll take care of it. That if we get them to do the job, then the job will be done and we'll have a clear path three to five years down the road. Is that somewhat yeah, correct? It's somewhat correct, and let me let me clarify that. <clears throat> Whatever they find, they, meaning Diener, Diener, finds in the assessment, Diener will fund and take care of. The assessment will only begin three to five years away. On the other hand, if in the assessment they find some things that are not good, who knows how many more years it may take for them to actually fund and clean up. <clears throat> One of the difficulties that we're facing is this. As uh, Michael said, there's 600 to 700 landfills that need to be, that need to have this assessment. The state only has enough funds for 40 or 50 <clears throat> per year. And when we ask them, where are we on the list? They said, well, you're not even on the five-year list. And we explained to them our dilemma, and they said, well, because of that, we will consider moving you up. But again, you know, we're, we're almost, if you pardon the expression, in stalemate over the assessment issue, because as you can appreciate, RDAF isn't going to let you spend any of their money until the assessment's done. And as a staff, we can't recommend you spend a half a million dollars on a park that in installing those things, we run into something that gives you a large liability. Somewhere along the line, we proceeded in good faith, and I'm not trying to assess blame or responsibility, just to understand the mechanics. We proceeded with this grant on the basis that an assessment wasn't necessary. Correct. And when did we find out an assessment was going to be necessary? About uh, 45 days ago. And from who? From a Diener, because remember, PARDAV is a part of Diener. And in there, in our review and analysis and making sure that we were covering all bases, those two segments of Diener both had to be contacted. Okay. Okay. Dr. Woodruff, I think it's also, <coughs> as I spoke with John Poole the other day, uh, four other communities have had this happen to them in the last two years. Um, unfortunately, this is sometimes what happens when you do business. 
uh, I don't think it's through any fault of anyone. It just happens as you go through a process of trying to develop a piece of property. These are sometimes, uh, unfortunately, the things you find out. That's been the case with other communities in North Carolina per Mr. Poole, and, and I think that's probably the case here. I got a question. All right. I sent you a, a, a message asking about the division of the funds for our matching money. Uh, the city's share that $500,000. Uh, 250000 was coming from the capital reserve fund with the council initiatives. Yes, sir, that's correct. correct. And the other $250,000 was dedicated to the uh, general fund. Now, 200, uh, I know that some of our capital improvement projects are going to come of age within the next few years, and, and that fund's going to beef up a little bit. Is that, am I saying that correctly? That's correct. Some of your debt will be paid off. Right. Okay. So uh, we've got that going for us. That's good. Okay. But, you know, I, my question is, you know, do we need to jump out right now and, and uh, find something else? To, to spend money on, you know, yeah, well. uh, I just think it would make good sense if, if Phillips Park is what we want to do, that Phillips Park is, is what we plan to do and where we've shown a need, then I think Phillips Park is, is where we should be focused at right now with this particular grant here. We're going to go ahead and do the assessment, you know, or ask the owner to do the assessment. Why not put this? Uh, it, uh, keep this uh, $250,000 in council initiatives uh, dedicated to that project. And if you have other funds coming available in that fund later on, you know, uh, you have general fund problems right now, correct? Yes, sir. Well, I was going to bring that up. It seems to me my recollection, which is not always that great, we wrestled with, what, with the question of whether or not we should approve this grant because of the city's perilous financial condition at that time. And since then, we've imposed an arbitrary limit of finding another 700000 because we don't know what the year is coming. So I think the prudent course is to, uh, based on the uncertainty we had about this grant at that time, we ought, we ought to uh, decline it until we find out exactly what Phillips Parks looks like and whether it can be approved for development. I mean, I, I wouldn't have a problem with putting that uh, capital reserve fund in advance, you know, for that project. I mean, you know, since we're going to have more money come available later. I'm not even sure I'd do that because we're not, we're going to give up the general fund money, so that money in a capital reserve fund is insufficient to carry out the grant. So. If we have another purpose in the capital improvement fund for that money, right. well, I agree it, that. it's there to be used for yeah. something more vital and, and higher higher priority. I was going to ask what, uh, <clears throat> how was how were we going to fund our 500,000 as far as timing? Was was 250,000 in this year's budget and 250 in next, or how did how would how did that play in the budget? Actually, in order to file the grant, we had to have the money secure. So we did have uh, in last year's budget two hundred and fifty thousand dollars set aside for the um, from the general fund balance, and two hundred and fifty thousand set aside from the capital reserve. So that money is already in a designated account. So what what was your plans if we, if we declined? Had you had you come up with some some ideas as far as what were you going to do with the money? Well, you know, first of all, the the first thought I had was along the lines of what Mayor Phillips had thought. And then I began to think about the timeline and the uncertainty of Phillips Park. We all know that we sat here at this table before the grant was ever accepted and we said, you know, this is really a difficult time to accept this grant because this wasn't the top park on our list. And remembering that, my thought to you is exactly as Mr. Bittner and the mayor have now expressed it. And that is, release the 250,000 back to the general fund balance no strings. Release the 250000 back to the capital reserve. That cannot be spent without your specific approval. There are other parks needs that we have today. We will analyze those and we'll come back either before next year's budget or in next year's budget and give you recommendations. I will tell you right now, if you have been to the bathroom, probably a bad way to say that, 
If you have been to Northeast Creek Park and you have had the experience of using those restrooms, I will tell you that's not a good experience. There are other priorities that we have. And so I would recommend to you that you release the funds. We do believe that when the assessment is over, if you still are comfortable with the proposed plans for Phillips Park, that we will assess it at that time, look at the financial condition of the capital reserve, and determine how we can come up with the match. I think that's probably all the direction you need, isn't it? Did you have a point? Yeah, I just wanted to say something too, though. It seems to me that by, I mean, I agree with what we're, where we're going with this, obviously, on that part. But it seems that we are committing to the Phillips Park project by conducting the assessment or asking Diener to spend two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars to give an assessment that will give clearance for this one specific use and I'm not saying I'm opposed to that but I just think that we should understand I mean that's the way I'm feeling about it yeah. is that if we say okay we'll, we'll you know hold the bus stop now but continue to conduct this assessment then then in a, in a way we are committed let me that we should be committed to it because we're asking the state to spend this kind of money just for us to have the option well let me yeah, let, let me clarify uh, one point the conceptual master plan caused Diener to come back and say we need to do a new assessment they're not assessing that on the fact that the bathroom is going to be in a particular location or that you're going to have all of these elements what they're saying is any concept plan that you want any change to the current utilization of the park is going to require an environmental assessment the environmental assessment is not about what does the amphitheater do or what does the garbage that's there do to the amphitheater it's really a new assessment that says should this be used as a park in, in any way? And we can get you better guidelines on that. But I, I apologize if I misled you thinking that the assessment just looks at at that okay. one use. It seems I to be sure to me that it would be a water quality issue down there with that with that creek that runs into the New I, River I, that they wouldn't have more of a, a vested interest in, in doing a permanent I uh, think you're exactly right. Assessment. assessment. I, I, and I don't know this for a fact, but from recollection, any landfill that was not properly closed under Diener's regulations in terms of a cap and a liner and so on, uh, it's probably on their schedule for an assessment to determine is there any leachate coming out of it, is there any methane gas being produced, and they're going to do this also, these landfills. And it's a big task, but it's an environmental challenge to make sure those landfills are imposing an environmental risk. And I think we, uh, we have regardless an obligation. Of, regardless of your plans for it. I think we have an obligation to our citizens to protect groundwater and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and the streams and rivers that run through this community. And I think that if the state is willing to go in there and do something more permanent as far as an assessment to clear that land, I mean, that's a, that's a win for us and a win, uh, you know, win for the city and a win for them. Yeah. How about if we do this? We will verify, and, and John and I will talk to the uh, folks at Diener relative to the landfill section and understand better what is their assessment actually going to accomplish. Because I do agree with Mr. Thomas when he says if the assessment is only looking at the current concept plan and that concept plan may not be what we want, that may not be a good expenditure. Exactly. If it's a more comprehensive assessment that can give us what Mr. Bittner is talking about, more of a step towards permanent <coughs> closure. So let us get that. I think the I important guidance that you're giving us tonight is this. Folks, don't move forward with the Part F grant. We will put a resolution on your agenda for the 21st of October if you for, for you to formally authorize us to turn the grant back in. I think that's the, I think that's the best uh, strategy. And, and your suggestions on the monies, I think, are, are kind of what we all would, would tend to support, too, I would think, from what I was hearing. So I'm that's sure the direction. Of, oh, uh, any other landfill property that we have not owned and we don't know about, or are these the only two that the city has to deal with? Or Actually, I don't know that, you know, but we will be happy to do some research. It doesn't seem like a good place money. to spend money anymore after this is going to be the situation if you go down the road to, to change something. 
20 years from now, you're going to start. Every time you turn around, you got to have to have yeah. another assessment and wait again. Unless it's something you really, <clears throat> you really want. It would be a forever. shame. It would be a shame to have that property sit there for years and years and years to, and not be able to be anything, any improvements made to it either. You know, we don't know what's going to happen years from now. It'd like to be some permanency to that. that. And before we leave Phillips Park, I want to to make one more statement to the public. We do not have any reason to believe that Phillips Park is not a safe park for people to use as it currently is being used. There was an assessment done in 1976 that was the basis for the current improvements. We have had no uh, reports of illness or problems. It is a safe park. We're just having to go through the bureaucracy of hopefully moving towards a more permanent closure. At this time, I would like to ask Michael and Susan to give you an update. I think you'll be pleased with what we've been doing in your other parks. Could I say something before Please. we move on? Um, about whether it's a good place to spend money for decades, the Environmental Protection Agency and state agencies have been encouraging communities to go from brownfields to greenfields and to take um, these areas that were once lands, landfills and make them into something uh, constructive. And you may not know it, but Kerr Street was a landfill the part where the baseball field is, not where the center is along Kerr Street. And when we put light poles out there, the new ones people realized because when they drilled it came to the surface. So we've had these things in the community and we're better off now for having spent some money and, and invested in them. And you know, there are challenges, but uh, I, it, I'm sure everybody perhaps, but um, Dr. Woodruff remembers Sturgeon City and what it, what it used to look like. And our city and community is much better for what it looks like now than what it did. So, you know, we have to be measured and we have to make decisions for today. But if you look at the history of it, you'll see that I think it's um, been a tremendous benefit to the city of Jacksonville, what we've done with old landfills. I would agree. You would have to good comment. Please. In this part of our presentation, we just wanted to bring you up to date on some of the projects we've done in our park, <coughs> some that have already been done and some that are in the process of being done. Uh, if you'll recall, Jack Amiette, uh, we replaced the front of the building, the facade. We've done some renovation to the uh, inside of the building as well as the restroom facilities. All those things have been completed. Jack Amiette looks new. It looks different, and it's a good different. Uh, we completed the shelter and playground along with the safety surface there. That was a great addition to that uh, park. And um, if you'll recall, we went ahead and, and had some money to put down the rubberized surface. Jack Amiet used to have a tile floor as its gymnasium. And some of us that grew up here can remember sliding around on that floor. That's not a problem anymore. We actually play youth games on this floor. And uh, it's it's been uh, uh, welcomed in this community, not only to our uh, department, but to our, our citizens that use the facility now. Is that the same type of floor as what we put over at Commons or something? Yeah, it truly exact is. Same floor. Exact same floor. More revitalization that's been done at Jack Amiet. What The picture you're looking at here, if you'll recall, this is where the, the old activities, ceramics, and senior citizens building uh, resided. We tore those down about three years ago and we installed two new basketball courts. One of these courts is replacing what was at Phillips Park. Remember, we were moving those out, that court out. This was one of the replacements to it, so we were keeping it in our inventory. Um, phase two of Jack Amiet's revitalization, you know, obviously we did a lot of work to the building and, and did the park shelter, moving the activities, building out, uh, basically rebuilding the ball field out there. Uh, currently, we do not have a ball field uh, until we've done this to Jack Amiet that houses what we call our older teenagers, our high school kids, even our middle school kids. We all we have, are familiar with Joe Morgan Field. Unfortunately, it's too small. It's always been too small. We've worked with it. Jack Amiet is going to allow us, I think their fences out there are going to be 320 feet now. Mm -hmm. So this is a field that we're all going to be proud of. It's going to be maintained to the same level as the fields at the Commons are competitive fields. Uh, we've added dugouts, new fencing, um, 
lights, irrigation, Bermuda sod, improved our drainage out there. And while you haven't seen this yet, because it's the last thing we're going to do, we're going to improve the parking over there, the flow of the parking. Before you leave that slide, if you go back one, I know many of you have had the opportunity to go by Jackham yet, but if you uh, have not, I would encourage you to go by. The, the staff suggestion of building the backstop where it looked like Wrigley Field was a great touch. It changes it from just simply another park to a specialty park. Having the brickwork at the bottom of the backstop and then having a quality backstop, it will in fact be with 350 foot fences, it will become the baseball facility for Onslow County. And I think the staff is to be commended for the design work they did here. Yes, kudos to our athletic it people. Been used it's, not it's, not it's not finished. finished. Oh, it's not finished. Our, our yeah. expectations that the ball field will be finished uh, mid October. Mid, mid to late October. Um, they'll have to put the sod down. We, our hopes are that this spring. Sod infield, that's going to be nice. No, no, in the, oh, outfield, no. In the outfield. We're still oh, clay just in the outfield. outfield. Yeah. Yeah. It's still going to be all clay infield? Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> again, with. <laughs> Phase three and four at Jack Amiet, adding outdoor uh, restroom facilities. You can see the uh, the pink area. That's where the restrooms would be. The blue area being a uh, splash pad. The red area being a walking trail. The neat thing about the walking trail, it's going to take us uh, literally from Jack Amiet's recreation center to the parking lot at Clyde Irwin School. So for our after school programs, those, those children will have ease of access getting over to us. Uh, the estimated cost to do these improvements are around $574,000. Kerr Street Park, the baseball field, Johnny Crawford Field. Um, again, we were moving out Joe Morgan Field from Phillips Park and replacing it at Jack Amiette. At Johnny Crawford Field, the Lions Field at Phillips Park, the smaller of the two fields. This is where it's being relocated, basically. And, and hopefully you've seen, just in the short term, I think the school's already utilizing that field. They were down there today. Yeah, and um, we've, we're in a two-phase process of putting some new fencing up. Uh, we have fencing almost all the way around the field. We're in the process of, of finishing that out with a new backstop and new dugouts and score booth. And hopefully that'll be done in the next two months. Yeah, to, to speak on that, council, approved the extension of the field and when we got the new fencing up the old fencing was was just suddenly an eyesore so we have taken uh, money from other accounts in the recreation and parks department and transferred that so that the additional roughly twelve thousand dollars needed to put in new fencing all the way around that way the dugouts the backstop everything are installed at the same time the same quality it looks like a fixed and finished field now or will as soon as they finish that work. What about naming uh, Joe Morgan Field? Uh, what's, what's the plan since we're closing that down? Is there plans on calling the one of Jack Amy at Joe Morgan Field, or, or do you know if that's... We haven't really talked talked about that. Um, you know, that I think that's a decision that ultimately will be made by council. There's been some concerns of the family that's been voiced also. About okay. that. He was a member of the council years ago. Right, right. right. Yeah, that's, that's a matter we are going to have to bring back, uh, you know, and, and decide how y'all are going to handle the naming. But again, I think you're going to be very, very proud of Kerr Street once we have finished it. Agreed. Um, some why of you... Would, why would we change the name? Just because we moved it? Well, I mean, that's, that's a discussion, is that if you are eliminating a field that was named for a person, what do you do with that name? And I don't know that uh, that it's appropriate to, if you pardon the expression, move one name and bump another name. I mean, it really becomes a policy. The field at uh, Kerr Street has been named, uh, you know, Johnny Crawford for oh, a long time. Oh, I see. You have a Okay. Just, but the new so, Ripper field, I've never right. had a name. It's, it's called just the, Jack Amiet yeah. Ball Field. It's yeah, so I would, you know, there's it's, an opportunity there. That's right. There is a Jack Amiet Rec Center there, Kerr. <clears throat> but again, as you will recall, the naming policy that we work under is the one adopted by the mayor and council. And only the mayor and council can designate a facility. So that will be back on your table. Moving forward, Wooten Park, uh, you're familiar with hopefully, the new playground and rubberized surface, the restroom facilities, which are basically our template for restrooms. You'll see that you see them over at the landing. 
and the relocation of, of the basketball courts more centrally located in the park. Some of the other work we did over there, thinning out the tree line on the trail section, has really given that park, park a total rebirth. We have had great responses, not only from the neighborhood, which we've got a great response from them, uh, the park is now more popular than ever. People go to this. This is a destination park for the trail. Uh, if you'll go on there, I think the fourth, fourth Friday of the month, the stroller strider are out there in mass I mean a hundred of them it's an extremely popular park uh, I think a lot of that while 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 updating the park was important I think making it more visible has, has ultimately made that park more usable Northeast Creek as you're, you're familiar with hopefully again we had a, a, a boat ramp down there and in the last two years we've added two new boat ramps We've uh, closed the lagoons that were part of the wastewater treatment facility uh, way back in our history. Can I interject? Does that does that have same sort of environmental considerations for assessments that a, that a landfill would or something similar? Uh, the answer there is no. We were able to get the necessary documents and we did all the soil testing so that once we uh, proved to them that there were no contaminants in there, we were able to actually close that. So we're not going to have the issues because that was not a landfill. That was, of course, a, uh, pardon the expression, a sewer lagoon. So, a good question. Some of the improvements that we feel are important for us to look at at Northeast Creek moving forward would be uh, the replacement of the boat bulkhead near the boat ramps. Uh, that's a, a concern moving forward that uh, while we don't have to do it this week or next week or even next year, it's something that we've identified that we're going to have to look at replacing. Uh, we'd also like to add the canoe and kayak launch to to the existing, uh, uh, just to the right of the boat launches. Um, and uh, again, the repair of the existing boardwalks out at Northeast Creek. And you remember the tour we took, I believe, in the winter, and uh, you can see the condition of the boardwalks. You know, it would be nice to come up with some, some way to permanently get around to having to worry about rising tides causing that to continue so we don't continue to spend money. Some of the improvements that we've done at the Commons, um, the adult softball fields in the last <coughs> three to four years, you know, we used to have two adult softball fields, we added two more. When we built those fields, we built them basically to the standards of our youth fields. Recently, in the last two years, we have taken the other, the initial two adult fields, and we have mirrored them also with our, our youth field. So what, what, what am I saying? What we have basically is the same facility uh, on both sides of the commons. We have four youth fields, we have four adult fields. They're maintained the same way. We have the same type of grass on it. These are very high competition level fields, very nice for our public. Warning tracks, there's a new concession stand out there, new restrooms, and uh, I'm sure you're familiar, if you're not, that some of the landscaping we've done, you know, we had an issue out there with um, flooding or water uh, around the middle of uh, what we call the wheel of the fields, and we did some uh, paver work out there and uh, we've resolved that problem uh, greatly. And we did install that with city labor and only spent about $11,000 solving a problem that had been estimated to cost over 100000 That's correct. Uh, just touching base again with the commons, as you'll recall, we replaced the new gym floor uh, with the rubberized surface. Um, we have gotten a great response, not just from our basketball leagues, from uh, the East Coast Invitational people, from uh, all of our rentals, and uh, our citizens and, and renters. Uh, they're very pleased with the surface. It's held up well for, from our perspective. It's, it's doing well and uh, a great addition to our city. And most recently, it was the site of the internationally advertised and visited pickleball tournament. Mm -hmm. Correct. Oh, yeah. Right. That's right. Well, we're on the map. <laughs> Over 100 <laughs> participants from as far away as Rhode Island. That's right. <laughs> Some people vision see. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, you know, if we hadn't had a pickleball visionary on our council, no telling where that would have been. Uh, some future improvements moving forward again, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not ne next week, but on uh, Gateway South, coming up Gateway South, that corner there as you turn on to Commons Drive North, expanded parking, uh, there's area there for uh, athletic field or, or multi-purpose fields as we continue to grow as a city. This is an area we've identified to grow at. Where's that area? As you come up uh, Gateway South, 
It's right on the corner there. Uh, yeah, behind the recently uh, Mayflower been. Restaurant. <laughs> 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 Is the sign still there? Yes. Yep. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I was just raising a question. It doesn't interfere with the proposed sell of the property on no, the other side of the street, does it? It does not. <laughs> uh, some of the future improvements at Richard Ray Park we're looking at, um, we're, we're looking at hopefully continuing the walkways uh, in the park, adding shelters to the park, uh, especially on the playground side. Uh, Additional parking at this park. This park is heavily used. Uh, parking is often one of the concerns in this area. We'd like to expand our landscaping. We have a nice uh, core landscaping area out there and we're very proud of it. There's things moving forward that we can continue to do out there. And while we do, while we did add restrooms <coughs> about three years ago on the landscaping side, I think as we, again, as we continue to grow as a city, we're gonna need to look at putting restrooms on the playground side. That's the heavier use side with the children and, and, and you know, moving forward would be a smart move for us to put restrooms over there. Overall, I think you can see that the investments you're making in your park systems are being fulfilled by the staff. Uh, we believe very sincerely that it's our mission to bring all of our parks up to a proper level before we expand the number of parks. And that's what you'll continue to see in your capital improvement budget each year. Thank you. At this time, if you would like, uh, we have about a 10-minute presentation from the uh, public safety folks on hazard mitigation. Then if you'd like, we can take a break and at that time go into your closed session if we have time. That sounds good. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, you going to come up too? How are you? You're doing great, sir. <laughs> Hazard mitigation plan, Spencer. Well, Mayor of Council, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be able to present this for you, um, or present this to you. The reason why I wanted to talk about hazard mitigation plan is because we're in the process of having to rewrite the, the hazard mitigation plan, which is a requirement every five five years that the plan be rewritten. So we just kind of want to give you some information, basically update you on what the hazard mitigation plan is, what it's about, and kind of a timeline. So hazard mitigation is obviously is a part of our emergency management process that where we sustain uh, action to reduce and eliminate any long-term risk to life and property. Um, as our Parks and Recreation folks just talked about a while ago, with regards to stormwater runoff at Phillips Park, that's some of those things that we're talking about. Uh, disaster prevention, uh, and, and, and this is all part of, or part of all phases of the emergency management cycle as illustrated in this, uh, this graphic here. Uh, as I said, the mit hazard mitigation is a uh, continuous part of the emergency management process and it's uh, our hazard mitigation basically equals disaster prevention. The efforts that we take up front prevent actual losses. Uh, so the hazard mitigation activities that occur include developing local plans and regulations, your stormwater regulations, uh, development codes, your unified development ordinances and the MSSD and those sorts of documents all apply toward uh, plans and regulations. And of course, the structure and infrastructure projects, uh, things that we do to help protect structures from being inundated by floods, uh, from being impacted by natural disasters and things of that nature, are all part of what they consider to be structure and infrastructure protection projects. A uh, good, good example is the recent Parkwood project that we went through uh, redoing the stormwater and uh, drains uh, in that area. <coughs> Also, what you see a picture that's <clears throat> partially obscure in here, but the, the, the slide is that uh, this is a picture of the Parkwood project uh, being worked on. And of course, uh, that's part of your natural systems protection that applies to your stormwater drains, your stormwater ponds, rather your retention ponds. And of course, one of the greater things that we like to do is education awareness programs, uh, stormwaters and uh, you can see Pat Donovan Potts there being engaged in educational activities with kids, teaching them about stormwater, uh, where they do the, the where the dye flows and that sort sort of thing to show them how how they how they can help reduce the impacts of stormwater. 
So why uh, do we plan for hazard mitigation? Well, as I said before, part of the part of the reason, obviously, the most obvious reason is to protect life and property. Uh, we want to try and reduce the impact where we can before disaster actually occurs. Some of those things that we're going to have in place, uh, a, a good example is to, going back to the plans would be a plan for debris removal, uh, where we don't, have, we don't have a way to stop tree limbs from falling, but we can have a plan in place to quickly get those tree limbs picked up, piled, and gotten out of the side of the city to reduce um, issues that occur with that, block roads and things of that nature. It also helped minimize economic losses. As you can imagine, if there weren't things in place to help manage stormwater and how it, uh, how it moves throughout the city, uh, it could cause some, some significant issues. We also look towards enhancing community resiliency. It's important uh, in our as part of a hazard mitigation plan and what we do to prepare for natural disasters to try and make sure that everything we, we can possibly do is economically feasible is to make sure that the city's always ready to operate, always ready to provide services, and that our citizens are always provided for safety. We also want to try and interrupt any repetitive losses from damages with regards to areas that can continuously become flooded, things of that nature. There's been many cities, including ours, where we've had repetitive losses. We've gone in and purchased that property, demolished any structures that were there, and, and basically disallow any construction to occur on those sorts of properties, at least <coughs> structures that will be damaged by floods and things of that nature. It also helps speed up recovery as I talked about with like uh, with regards to like the um, the debris removal projects, debris removal plans and it also uh, helps us to be in compliance with state and federal uh, requirements and this is a requirement in order for us to be able to be reimbursed uh, after disasters and things of that nature, uh, this is a requirement we have to have in place. <clears throat> so, the federal uh, the federal aspect of it, uh, the federal government put into place a disaster management or mitigation act of 2000, uh, uh, the year 2000, which is part of the Robert T. Stafford Act or Robert T. Stafford funding, uh, and this uh, this act basically essentially requires municipalities, local municipalities and governments to put into place a, a hazard mitigation plan to affect ways of mitigating effects of disasters. Like I said before, the plan is updated every five years, has to be updated every five years, and it has to go through an approval process starting with you, going to the county, up to state emergency management, and then to FEMA with the federal government. Once it goes through the approval process, the federal government receives it, FEMA receives it, then they will do the final approval on the plan and essentially send that document back to us with a stamp of approval on it, and then you will have to adopt the program or adopt the plan. Our plan is part of an annex which is a, a part of the Onslow County uh, Hazard Mitigation Plan. It was first adopted in 2004, uh, and the last edition we had was in 2009, which brings us to this year where we're having to work towards uh, re renewing the, the data in it. The update is going to reflect new data, primarily changes in demographics, and then there are some things that FEMA is kind of looking for us to add into the document, which is just basically formatting more than anything else. And of course, uh, overall, the push for the plan to be an update is being led by Onslow County. And we, we, there's a partnership established between us and Onslow County and other municipalities in the county as well in order to finalize the final document, which is a county document. So in a nutshell, uh, the schedule for what is planning to take place is tonight you'll have a public hearing on the matter which will allow uh, an opportunity for public comment about the hazard mitigation plan itself. Hmm? That's not on the schedule or not? <laughs> what else my mistake then? <laughs> <laughs> what he meant to say was that on October 21st, <laughs> it'll be on that one. Okay. Yeah, there you it'll go. It'll be approval by the city. <laughs> there you go. So October 21st, <laughs> October 21st is when we're looking for, for council to approve the plan. 
uh, to be submitted to the county. And then on November 3rd, the county will approve the plan. And they'll submit it to the North Carolina State Emergency Management, uh, the November, December time frame, and then it'll go to the federal government from there. And it'll take them uh, at, their, at their leisure to be able to, to approve the plan we suspect, can only imagine, it'll only be between early to mid-2015. Once the federal government approves the plan, that's when the document becomes live. So if they approve the plan on May 25th of 2015, then five years later, May 25th of 2020, is when that document will have to be revised. And that's irrelevant of when City Council adopts it. So. Okay, and that was a real quick down and dirty about the hazard mitigation plan. Didn't want to take up much of your time, but I just wanted to kind of give you a briefing on that uh, so you know what to to be expecting on October 21st. Do I have any questions of Chief Leaf? <coughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks. Good job, Spence. Thanks. All right, I would entertain a motion now, unless anybody's got anything else right now. No, sir. Entertain a motion to uh, go into closed go session. Into co closed session right now and uh, to discuss personnel matters. Okay. So moved. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. If you want to get your